Good evening. God bless you. Welcome to another edition of the Glory Roadmap. My name is Henry Falcone from Flame of Fire Kingdom Advancing Ministries. And it is a pleasure to be here with you tonight. God bless you. Um, I'm going to make sure that we're on Facebook and I need to, I always do go check it because, yep, there we are. Good, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. So I can make sure that all the chats, I can read them on Facebook and also from Ustream. Amen. What a blessing to be here with you. Um, if you didn't get it, if you didn't get an opportunity to watch um, last night's um, broadcast, uh, excuse me, Sunday night's broadcast, I really encourage you to do so. It was so powerful. I just got to fix my collar here. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Looks like it's, the camera's back. That's why. Okay, I got it. There we go. I was all set till I got up about two seconds ago. But anyways, <laughs> that's the that's the wonderful about the about these these broadcasts because. You know, one of the things that um, when I really prayed about doing them, I didn't want to do them. I really fought it. I think most of you have heard this before, but um, I really fought doing broadcasts. I liked writing, though I'm not the best writer in the world. It was just, I felt like I, I could articulate myself better in writing. And plus I could go back and proofread it. <laughs> I never wanted to do any broadcast or any type of video stuff, but after many people saying, you really need to do a broadcast, you really need to do a video, I prayed about it. And my daughter, my wife, Reverend Lynn, a few other people said I really needed to um, um, do it. And so I was really hesitant because I, you know, I've watched a lot of the broadcasts. I've seen them and I know how they get really polished and, um, you know, and just really professional looking broadcasts. And there's nothing wrong with that because, you know, there's an excellence in broadcasting and, and doing that. Um, the only thing that I, um, I guess what was really hesitant for me was that, you know, I don't want it to be staged. I didn't want to do something that everybody else was doing, not for the sake that they were doing it or to be different. I just felt in my heart, I couldn't do something that was exactly what you would expect a broadcast to be. Uh, time, you know, um, time limits, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, professional polishing, all that kind of stuff, I, you know. I do have an IT guy that puts a, you know, on our, our YouTube page. He'll put a a, a picture on it, a, a logo over it for, of what the broadcast is about, and some some little things on it. But the actual broadcast itself, I really felt was to be simple, honest, and real, and no pretending, no trying to be uh, religious or super spiritual, just to be real. That we would have an encounter with the real God. And he would encounter with us and he would reveal to us together what his heart is and share and if he would trust us with the secrets and the mysteries of the kingdom that's what i um desired uh, from the lord i just didn't want to do a canned video and there are some that are you know that you know they're done from their homes and they're wonderful and stuff like that they're really like home i call them homegrown like homegrown broadcast or if that's what you want to call them um but i was hoping and praying that these broadcasts would be just, you would just hear a voice, the voice of the Lord. You know, like John the Baptist, when they asked him who he was, he didn't say, hi, I'm I'm, 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 I'm Prophet John. He's, I'm, I'm from Prophet John's ministry. I'm, I'm from uh, In the Wilderness Ministries, you know, and, uh, you know, here's my card. And it was pretty interesting just to think a little bit about, um, you know, um, John's, uh, I don't know where that came from, okay, uh, John's, um, answer when they asked him who he was and you know how he answered them he said i'm a voice crying in the wilderness prepare ye the way of the lord he never even brought attention to himself he never even told him what his name was he identified with what he god created him to be and that was to be a voice a voice crying in the wilderness and what was and with a message prepare ye the way of the lord and make the crooked places straight he came with a message, a message of repentance, a message of baptism by water. And then he said, the one coming after me is mightier than I, and he's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And so he was a way maker. He was a forerunner for Jesus. And I believe that what these broadcasts are is, I hope, under that John the Baptist type of work of the Lord, an apostolic prophetic work that is pointing and making a way for the Lord. It's making a way to make the crooked places straight, to make a way in our hearts. And, you know, in that that in it, you would hear the, the tribe of Issachar anointing where, you know, that God would give us the, the understanding of the times and the seasons of what he's doing, who he's raising up, who he's taking down. 
And that's what these broadcasts started out. They started out as a like a, a spiritual update to kind of, you know, especially when COVID came, just to listen to the Lord. What was the Lord saying to us? How did God want us to change? How did God want us to repair? And now three years later, you know, we're still doing the same work on these broadcasts of, of the unfolding glory roadmap of the Lord. And so it's really been a blessing um, to be able to be with you. And I thank, thank God for all of you that are able to, to join in today. Amen. And uh, praise God for that. Hallelujah. And, um, you know, I just, uh, um, let me see if I can, do, I don't know if I can do that. But um, anyways, thank you, Lord. No, I guess I can't, but that's all right. So let's pray. And if you haven't signed in already, please sign in. Let it, let me know who you are and where you're from. That would be a great blessing. Uh, everyone who signs in, we you know we pray for you. We pray for your uh, families, and if you have ministries, we pray for your church ministries. And so we do that. And Sister Sonia from Philadelphia, my sister, Amen. God bless you, Sister Sonia. We love you. We miss you. And uh, let's just go before the Father. Thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We worship you tonight, Lord. We just worship you, Lord. In absolute weakness, God, you are strong. Lord, you know. You know who you want to speak to tonight, who you want to reach, where they are, and how to bring that broadcast to them or them to the broadcast. So, Lord, I pray right now for a supernatural intervention that you take it beyond anything man can do. Any types of filters that Facebook or YouTube are using to try to suppress these messages. Let your Holy Spirit take us past those suppression things, Lord, so that your word will get to those that you want, Lord. You see their attempt, Lord, to silence the voices, Lord, and especially even Christian voices, Lord. But the voices that speak the truth they don't want to hear. Lord, and but you are bigger than that. And you can take this broadcast and bring it wherever you want and to whom you want it to go to, Lord. So we put it into your hands. And we pray and we welcome your manifested presence, Jesus, to be in our midst. And we welcome you. We welcome you to come. You said, for to those that I love and keep my commandments, we will come and we will manifest ourselves to them. So thank you for coming and manifesting yourself to us tonight, Lord. We so appreciate you. We so love you, Lord. We give you glory, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. So, good evening, Sarah. Glad you could join tonight. Our sister from Connecticut. Hallelujah. I'm just excited about all that the Lord wants to reveal to us and show us um, uh, tonight and about the difference between his presence and his glory. I was sharing the other night Back around 2013, 2014, the Lord began to send us to have meetings, call it conferences or whatever you want to call it, and um, and just to bring people into into that presence of the Lord. And um, I had up, I had ministered in upstate New York probably back around 2008, seven, somewhere around there, nine. And uh, the ministry I was connected with for 25 years is, was out of uh, out of um, Salisbury Center, New York, a place called Pinecrest um, Bible um, Training Center. And um, under the direction of our brother Wade Taylor, um, who was a real spiritual father to many and a man deep, 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 deep in God had much deep understanding and revelation of the coming kingdom and, and the understanding of the kingdom age and the preparation of a people. And I was so blessed to be able to uh, meet him. And I met him at the right point in my life where honestly, I thought I was crazy because everyone was so working so hard for God, evangelizing, doing all those things, having marches for Jesus and doing all the activities and works of the Lord. But, you know, I did all those things, but there was a hunger in me, a passion in me for God, to know God, more of him, you know, and that hunger and thirsting in me you know, was really kind of targeted by many religious spirits and religious people that said, you know, you, you're going to become so spiritually minded 
that you're no earthly good. So, you know, you don't have time to spend with God. Don't you know that you, you got to win the lost at all costs? And, you know, there's some truth in that, of course. You know, we need to win the lost. But I did all of those things. I don't know about you. And yet my heart was still not satisfied. There was a longing. There was a longing. I, can't, I, I call it a desperation to know the Lord. And I would get up early in the morning. And I would, as Donna would go into work, like seven to eight, and the kids went off to school, I would go up to a place in Waterbury, Connecticut, and sometimes down in Meriden, Connecticut, where I lived, and, and you know, in the diner. And I would stay there from seven to eight o'clock in the morning till three o'clock in the afternoon, just sitting with the Lord. You would say, that's kind of strange. Why, would, why wouldn't you go someplace that's private? Well, I was a restaurant manager. And so one of the things as a restaurant manager I was able to do is learn how to block out the sounds. You know, so I could work. I would do my schedule. I, my eyes didn't get blocked out because I had to see what was going on. But I could, you know, um, actually tune out the, the noises around me. So I felt very comfortable in the restaurant atmosphere to be able to sit and hear the Lord. Eventually, I got those, remember those bulky headphones that you used to put over your head, not the, the earbuds? And I would bring those and I would put them in, you know, into a, um, I forgot what they called back then. And what were those things called, those little things? Do you remember what they were? I can't remember the name of them. But then you put music on them. Anyways, whatever that was, you know. And so I would take that with me and, you know, and and th that would help just let me be alone with the Lord. And I had so many encounters with the Lord in a restaurant, if you can imagine. So many personal encounters with God there, you know, um, you know, where he really came to meet with me and sit with me and teach me and instruct me. Psalm 32, 8, that he would instruct me and teach me in the way that I would go. And, you know, and guide me with his own eyes. But in sitting in that presence of the Lord with him there, you know, I would just take my Bible and just leave it before him and just, you know, uh, ask him to lead me where he wanted me to read for that day. And I would, and I would just, I, in the beginning, I would read my Bible like a history book. Anybody else do that? I just read it like chapter, you know, I did one of those Bible things, read the Bible in a year, you know. And so I would read it and it was good information. But the Lord told me while I was reading, he said, slow down, meditate. It says, meditate on the word day and night. He said, Henry, read it sentence by sentence and start in John chapter 15. So I started in John, John chapter 15, you know, and, and I just read it one line at a time. And all of a sudden, I mean, I was, the Lord so came and taught me. I, the Lord, Psalm 32, 8, will come to teach you and instruct you in the ways of the way of the Lord. And I think what was happening at the time we were developing a, relationship of intimacy you know even in the restaurant you wouldn't think he would meet you in the restaurant but it's funny that when we ended up in 2013 14 15 going up to to um uh, new york upstate new york um we were invited to go to houses and we missed it in houses and we missed it in church one one church for one week another 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 for another one we went up there twice once for tw 21 days once for 32 days and we missed it everywhere and you know what the beautiful thing was that the presence and glory of God came with us everywhere we met. It was like he was leading us by a cloud by day and by a fire, of not, fire by night. What I experienced in New York was different than anything I had ever experienced before in ministries. You know, we've gone places before, but God was birthing something new. We were learning to be trained not to move without the pillar moving, without the cloud by day moving and the fire by night. And, and that fire and cloud actually was leading us from place to place, from destination to destination. And everywhere we go, there was one cry, bring them to me, bring them to me, Henry. And I watched the youth in churches and I watched the young people and I watched the young adults. I watched pastors and, and leaders come, you know, uh, to varying degrees to be the Lord. But I want you to, I want to share with you tonight a little bit about how to go from presence practically into the glory realm of the Lord. And why God asked me to do the convergences and to have these, these gatherings where there's no agenda, right? There's no guest speakers except the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. There's no time limits and time frames because the Lord through the structure of the holy place ministry where the ritual acts of worship were, and we just entered in behind the veil. We actually entered into David's tabernacle where it was just us in the ark or us in the glory of God. And that revelation started to come and we experienced we began to expand, expand the taste of his glory and when i share this with many ministers they've had encounters like that they've had encounters with with that type of glory so when i start talking about this new that started in 2020 they assume it's that oh i've experienced that already 
And that's one of the biggest hindrances for you to really change is, is, is when you know it all, you know, when I've experienced that already, I know this already. I have been walking for, with the Lord over 35 years, okay? And I have never experienced what I'm experiencing now. I would lie if I told you I did. What we're experiencing now personally and in the convergence is nothing like I've ever experienced before. And I have seen, I have been in movements of God. I've been in revivals. I've been in, in, in uh, you know, refreshings. I told you last time that I went to Toronto, you know, when they had that outpouring of the, the river of God, the fire of God, that refreshing of the Lord. I went there 13 times over the several years and brought many people to go up there. And in, in that place, I had never met the Lord like that before. I've never seen the power of God manifest to make people shake like this before. And a lot of people didn't like it because of the shaking. They didn't like the manifestations, how God touched his people. So they just wrote it off and said that was all, all flesh. They were just so very, very wrong. You know, God shook us with his power. I mean, I felt it. I felt like electricity coming all throughout my body. I couldn't even stop my hands from shaking or the power was so strong. The only thing you could do is bow down and go, whoa, you couldn't even stand. And, and you can ask Donna, you couldn't even stand in the glory of the Lord. Those meetings were so powerful. And I, I got to go to the first Catch the Fire conference in Toronto, Canada, when John Arnott was there. And um, I forgot what the guy's name was now. Holy Spirit, bring it back to me. Um, hmm. I can't remember it. But anyways, uh, he was he was the one that God really used to speak. You know, he had gone. He was a pastor that was ready to give up and he was going to kill himself. He brought a gun to kill himself, you know, because he thought he was such a failure in ministry and in life. And and so he ended up going to a Rodney Howard Brown meeting down in Florida. And um, he said, Lord, if you don't do anything, that's it. I'm dead. And he got up to the altar and, you know, they prayed with him. Nothing. And so he went back to his seat. That's it, Lord, I'm leaving. And the Lord said, go again. And for my, if I understand his testimony correctly, he went up six times and nothing happened. And then he went the seventh time. Sounds like Naaman who had to dip seven times. He got so filled with the joy of the Lord and God supernaturally met him, right? And, and he was laughing and crying and he healed him and delivered him and he's changed. And John Arnott invited him up to share that testimony. That's all it was, is a share the testimony of what he experienced there. And when he shared that experience, as he was sharing, holy laughter started to fill people. They started to get drunk in the Holy Spirit. I experienced some of those things without ever going there before. So that wasn't new to me. But what was new to me was the tangibleness of God. The person of God was so revealed in those meetings. Maybe it was, maybe it was just for me. I don't know. I don't know how, how, how anybody experienced it. But if you can imagine, you know, um, a, a being there, and uh, this is the first time I ever heard of Joanne McFadder. She was there, and David Roos was there. They were two strong mu musicians. And as we were, as I was there, I have to tell you that that's where I began to taste that glory. God had given me a word back in 1991 or 90, 91, 92, that from a, a minister from a Ruth Heflin's ministry, who was one of the first forerunners of understanding the glory of the Lord and experiencing the glory realm. She wrote many books about it, Ruth, Ruth Heflin and, her, and Gloria Heflin. And one of her ministers, uh, 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 Pastor David uh, Dennis Pazani, came to our church. And um, while he was there, he said, uh, Pastor Henry, the Lord says to you, Make his glory your main function and your purpose. For in that glory, all your needs will be met and the needs of his people. I didn't know what he was talking about. I really didn't. And even when I went to Toronto, experiencing that glory realm for the first time, I didn't even know it was a glory realm. I knew the presence of the Lord. We had had an outpouring of laughter. We had an outpouring where God has really moved in our churches. As a matter of fact, we at the time were probably one of the most freest churches in the area. I'm not boasting, but we really did let the Holy Spirit move. And we really did get rid of the time frame from, from the most part. And, and, you know, and, you know, so God was beginning to remove the structure and the more the structure of what we used to do to keep everything nice and neat in two hours, you know, the more the structure got removed, the more God came. Isn't that something? The more the structure got removed, the more God came. And when the Lord started to have us remove the structure of, of, of the order of services, six songs, three fast, three slow, the announcements, you know, um, the offering, the preaching, and praying with people. When the Lord said, stop that, don't do that. 
And he literally told me to stop it. He actually froze me in one, one service where I was coming out. I got frozen in my tracks. I really did. I'm not joking. I could not move. And the only one that knew that I was frozen was my son, who was four years old at the time, who was playing the drums with my drummer. And while they're worshiping, the Lord said, I don't want you to do what you're about to do. And what was I about to do? I'm sharing the difference between presence and glory. I know that may not seem that way to you, but I hope pastors and leaders, and even in your own time, to go deeper into the glory realm of God, you have to allow the Lord to change your approach to him. I call it the protocol of approach. And that protocol of approach is what does God want? What does he want from you, from worship? What will minister to his heart? What is it that he desires? I didn't know this back then. I thought what I was taught, I was taught by my pastors and his pastors, this is how you do a service. And I did it faithfully, you know, two hours, get you out. And I used to say, I'll get you home for the football games. For those football fans, I get you home for lunch. Then it won't keep you past that. I used to say it because my pastor said, I didn't realize how hurt God was by me saying that. Because what I was saying was, I will get you out and enough time so you can enjoy what you want to do that day. So that you can go about your priorities. We will just get enough of God that will fit nicely into our Christian life. I call that the American Dream Church. I'll get enough of God to, just to fill me up so that I can make it to Wednesday. <laughs> you know, a Wednesday night or Thursday, whenever your midweek service. And then hopefully you got enough, you know, maybe by doing a little Bible devotion at home. And so our Christian life was basically, you know, uh, we'd have devotional time, we'd read the word, you know, we'd go to church, we'd go to service, and then we'd do our ministry. And that was what Christian life really in America was identified at. And the whole idea was to get more people in the church. And all, all our activities were to get more people in the church. And many times pastors would bash other pastors to try to get them out of their church to come to their church. And so anyways, that's another topic for another day. But in the midst of that, God froze me. And this is what he said. This, I want you to see the step-by-step -step progression, how to go from the presence to the glory. He said, Henry, I don't want you to do with what you're about to do. I said, Lord, what am I about to do? He says, I want you to worship me until I tell you to stop. Then I want the people to be able to speak and hear me and let them speak and move until I tell, tell you to stop. Then what I gave you to share, share it until I tell you to stop. And then at the end, bring the people before me and I will show you what to do and how to minister, how I want to minister to them until I tell you to stop. Notice what happened that day. I was talking to you on Sunday about, we, I, God gave me a powerful word to us all on Sunday about the Godhead, about Jesus as our Godhead. And why he has hair as white as, white as snow, why his eyes are like fire, and why his mouth was coming out of his mouth, a double-edged sword. If you didn't hear that uh, part of this, you need to go back and listen to Sunday nights. I mean, I didn't even have anything to share that night, which because I had just gotten done with a funeral and a couple of things my, of my son-in-law's mom. And I almost was going to cancel it. I almost was going to cancel it because I was drained and tired. And I said, Lord, do you want me to do this? I, I mean, you know, I, and I asked Donna, she says, well, maybe you should cancel, you know, if you're tired and stuff. And and, and probably about 10 minutes before uh, seven, the Lord said, Henry, feed my sheep. And so that's all I needed from the Lord was a direction, knowing that God was going to bring forth that which he desired. And because it, it's not me that's bringing it, it's him that's bringing it. And so it was a very powerful word of the Lord. Now, tonight. I believe what the Lord is having me begin to share to you is to share the practical experience of how to go from his presence to his glory and the spiritual preparation that God does in your life to prepare you for glory because you have to be prepared for it. You have to be acclimated so that you can learn how to function in the realm of glory. You got to get acclimated to know, first of all, what glory is, what, what God's glory does because it's him. It's God is glory. His glory is his person and how he wants to manifest his person to you in your midst, in your heart, in your life, in your mind, your soul, your body, in the corporate expression. Notice he wants to manifest his glory. And I said, the more that I was, the more that I removed the structure, the more of the glory that was seen. So to walk in the realm of glory, you got to remove the structure that you have built for your life. What you do with your day, what you do with your time. 
the way that you've always approached God, how you do your services, how you do your ministries. And anyone that has an ear to hear tonight, you know, ear to hear and eyes to see, if you will truly hear the, what the Lord's asking from you, it's asking you to lay it all down. The way that you've approached him, the way that you know him, the way that you see him, the way you play your instruments, the way you preach, he wants you to lay it at his feet. And in my case, back in 2020, Donna told, God told Donna that we needed to burn the ships, which means everything we were doing, we were training intercessors, we were traveling many places and doing a lot of work inside churches then, training intercessors, ministering to them when we were invited to go to many places. Different And it was wonderful. We even took our, our missionary students on those trips. We were in San Diego, San Marcos, uh, Ohio, uh, uh, Jackson Center, Ohio, with New York and Albany, Schenectady, um, all different places, Delaware, Baltimore. Um, you know, I can't even remember all the places God would send. Them. And it was wonderful. And we had the presence of God in those meetings. And we even had part of the glory. At times, I know that God's glory was there for, for moments. But what did it take to get prepared for the glory? One, I had to have a word from the Lord where God gave me a specific direction, make my glory. I didn't even know what that was. Make my glory, you know, your main function and purpose for in that glory, all your, all your needs and the needs of people will be met. It was after that God began to open up to me, John chapter two, about the miracle of Cana. I studied that for 10 years. I studied Zechariah chapter three for maybe 10 or 12 years, all of these, maybe 10 or 15 years, and the book of Revelation for that long, and certain Ezekiel and certain sections of the Bible, the Lord would not let me go with, and I had to meditate on it, and it would give me a little bit more manna, a little bit more, and I began to eat that hidden manna, and in that hidden manna was the functioning of a kingdom, the functioning of the king, our functioning of what God wants us to be and what he's creating us to be and what he's forming us to be. So much of what you are hearing me share has been burning in me for maybe 20 years more, maybe longer than that, about the preparation of a people. I, w I wondered if we'd ever get to the day where I'd see it. I was praying that I would see it in my lifetime, and I am, and I'm grateful to the Lord. Of seeing this day, this third day. I didn't even know what the third day was. I didn't even understand. I looked at John chapter two and I said, it says on the third day, there was a wedding at Cana. And I said, what does that mean? Why is there a third day on the third day after what? And I had to really ponder. He didn't answer me right away. He was waiting to see if I was going to really want to know if he would really teach me. And eventually he did. Same thing in Matthew 17, which says six days after this. Jesus took Peter, James, and John and brought them up a high mountain six days after what? What does that mean? Then he brought me to Hosea chapter six. Chapter six. It says, you know, the Lord has stricken us and he's bound to, he stricken us and he gave us bruises, but now he's healing us. And after two days, he will revive us. But on the third day, he will lift us up, right? That we might, that we might live before him. What is that? And then he took me over to uh, um, um, uh, Luke chapter 13. Where the strangest conversation, where, where, where Herod is coming, where the Pharisees are saying to Jesus, Herod's coming to kill you. And Jesus says, go tell that fox. What is that? That's just not dialogue. Go tell that fox that today and tomorrow I do healings and miracles, but on the third day I'll finish my course. These are scriptures that God supernaturally brought to me and made me chew on them and understand them, that, that all of them are tied together to show us a day, a season, a new day, a kingdom age where God was going to take us out of the holy place, out of the outer courts, and bring us behind the veil into the realm of the glory, and the glory realm, you know, and before the throne of God. And then it was after those scriptures gave foundation, he had me chew Revelation chapter one through five. I have been in that for at least 20 years. And it, it took years for God to explain to me what, 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 why did Jesus stand there like that? I asked him, why are you showing him, why are you showing yourself like that? What does that mean? Why are your feet like fire burning as an oven? Why is your hair as white as snow? Why are your eyes like fire? Why, why you know, why is your, uh, 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 a double-edged sword coming out of your mouth? Why do you have this beautiful white robe on and in your hand you're holding seven stars? You got a gold sash around your face, uh, your waist, and you are burnt, your feet are burning like an oven. What does that mean? Then what does Zechariah chapter three mean, Lord, where, where you are, um, you know, where uh, Joshua, the high priest is standing before the Lord and he's got dirty garments. I said, I thought they died. Why are you showing Zechariah, Joshua, the high priest before the Lord? And why do you rebuke Satan and move him out of the way? And why do you give a command, remove his filthy clothing and remove the turban and clothe them with rich apparel? 
And then why did you say to Joshua, if, you know, now Joshua, you know, you're, you're, you're part of the brand that's been plucked out of the fire. What's that? You see, I always had this question why in me when I read the scriptures. And when, 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 when uh, I was at Christian International, um, which is, uh, what used to be the late Bishop Hammonds. He was an apostle, prophet. And when I went to one of his conferences with Donna, they singled me out and they brought me up to the front and they said, you have an apostolic calling upon your life. You know, now actually said, you, you, this is what they said. From the time you were little, you always saw things and you knew things ahead of time. And you always asked the question, why? And I did. Yeah, I drove my teachers and my mother crazy. My father, I'd ask why, 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 why? And he said, that is the apostolic anointing. And you're being called to be an apostle. And he said, do not go out starting apostling. He said, and do not make your apostle card. It's God has given it to you in seed form and it will come out at the right time. Now, I got that word back in the early 90s. Okay. Um, yeah, probably yeah, 91. I didn't understand what the gift of an apostle was. I understood what they did, but I didn't, I didn't understand the power of the apostle from the realm of glory until I went to Millican, Colorado. It was in Millican, Colorado, when I was asked to go preach at a, um, at, 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 at a uh, they were having a tent revival. And my friend, pastor that took us on mission trips to Mexico, asked me to come up and lead pastor's prayer for a week because he knew we were prayer ministry. He said, I've invited all the pastors to come out for a week, you know, and to come to pray. And um, so long story short, on day one, when the, uh, at nine, when people were supposed to come, not one pastor showed up the entire day, not one, not even the host pastor. And I was left there alone with my team, three of us, and my keyboard. And I said, Lord, am I, did I miss it or something? I called my pastor at the time and I said, pastor, what should I do? There's nobody here. You know, and he goes, well, well, it, you're there for your friend, right? He's having a tent meeting. I said, yeah. He said, well, pray for the tent meeting. I said, I can do that. So I sat down on the keyboard and I played one of my favorite songs. It's called Resting Place. And it says, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you built for me? And when I sang that, this is where for the first time I began to understand the apostle operation within me because it was there prophetically god gave me an open vision apostolic showed me the condition of the church in that area but the highlight was on the young people i saw what we were doing by the structure to the youth to the young people in sunday school youth group meetings and what i saw was we were worshiping the lord and we were in his presence and god was ministering to us but because we didn't want to be bothered with little kids, because we didn't think that they could contain the glory or his presence, we oftentimes put them off into Sunday school. You know, there was a time they got to stay a little while, then we put them in Sunday school. And obviously there was nursery and stuff like that. And so the only ones that were left were probably the older, maybe the older teens and the adults. And the Lord, and the Lord put in my heart, um, you know, I felt his heart was broken. He said, why did you take them away from me? Why did you, why did you take them away? And all of a sudden I looked outside of the church building in this vision and I saw a corral and I saw several corrals. One was called youth group. One was called children's church. One was called, called this ministry, Royal Rangers or whatever you call it. You know, all wonderful things. But he was weeping. He said, why did you take them away from me? Why didn't you let them stay with me? Did you not think I could not use them or minister to them? And I had to repent personally because I had done that for years. Then we had to repent for the pastors that were in the area. Okay. And we did. But as we did that, that first day, I said, Lord, now what? On day two, I want to show you a little bit about the operation of glory versus the presence of the Lord. I believe when we started worshiping the Lord and I just to worship him and minister to his heart, as a psalmist. That psalmist ministry, we didn't have a time frame. We didn't have a structure. You took us past the presence of the Lord where we felt the Lord, where the Lord ministered to us. We went past that ministry of being ministered to, to be ministers to God. Instead of being ministered, God ministered to us. In that moment, we became ministers to God. We began to express that love and worship and pour it upon his feet. And he came. 
and he came with instructions and he came with blueprints. That's what glory brings you. Glory is not an ooze. It's the heartbeat of God. I'm going to say that again. Glory is not an ooze. It's the heartbeat of God. And in that heartbeat are his desires. In that heartbeat are the thoughts and plans that he has for you and for your life, for your wife, your children, your husband. And that's why we have to come up into the glory realm because there are instructions. We're not seeking instructions. We're seeking God. But in the God's glory is his heartbeat. In God's glory is his thoughts the secrets and the mysteries of the kingdom. Even to this day, I don't seek God to know the secrets and mysteries of the kingdom. I just seek God, period. If he shows me something wonderful, if he has me pray, wonderful. I'm not in charge of our time together. I'm not trying to get something from God. I'm not trying to seek God for a message that I got to preach on Sunday or Wednesday. I stopped doing that a long time ago. Even as a pastor, I stopped seeking God for message, mess, for message. Because the Lord told me that the message and the messenger have to be one. So I asked the Lord to make me a messenger. Do you hear what I just said? I asked him to make me a messenger. Because that's what glory does. It makes you a messenger. The message and the message have to be one. You see, you can preach a message and have a revelation and preach it and never have that one with you. It's not your life experience. It's a revelation, but it's not an experience. I will not preach that which is not worked within me. I cannot preach what is not worked in me because that word has to become flesh my life's experience. I'm not going to preach a revelation. I could have preached some of these things years ago. There are things still to this moment I have never shared with anybody. I haven't because the timing's not right. Why? Because they came from the glory and they have to be released in a glory presence. Does that make sense to everybody? That's why we have to make our relationship with the Lord right now, not about us, but all about him. In the church age, it's all about us. It's all about God meeting the needs of men. And that is true. God wants to meet the needs of men. I know what Luke 14 says, or Luke 4, 18 says, and that's the truth. That's the gospel message. That's the gospel message, you know, of salvation. But that's the beginning of the message of the kingdom is to be saved. The finishing message of the kingdom is to rule and reign. And we have to preach the beginning, the middle, and the end. And we have to become the message of the beginning, the middle, and the end. And that way we can become the messengers of it. I don't know if I'm making any sense. I hope I'm just not babbling tonight. You know, I hope this is really uh, helping us to see how do we go from the presence of the Lord into the glory way in a very practical way. So as I was at that meeting, okay, the next day, supernaturally this is why it's glory three ladies came one of them was uh, uh, reverend dolores the second one was reverend Teresa, who went home with the lord and the third one was uh, uh, mary Ram mary ramirez and these three were mighty prayer w women of god they came in they joined us when they came in i asked them are you pastors because i thought they were pastors in there they said no i said no i said well why are you here i they said we heard there was a prayer meeting here and they were a little afraid to tell me why i said we didn't invite just the pastors. Did you go? To, did you go? Did you go to any churches here in Milken? No, they went to church in Greeley, Colorado. They said the Holy Spirit told them there was prayer there. Did you hear what I just said? The Holy Spirit told them there was prayer there. And when we prayed, God began to reveal strategies. See, we began to function in the glory of the Lord. I didn't know that then. The apostolic anointing that God was enabling me with has to function in glory. Make the glory your main function and purpose. The apostolic calling on my life does not function in the understanding of a church age apostle. It can't. It wasn't made for that. You know, and that's why I don't call myself an apostle. I don't call myself a prophet, a teacher. I, I, you know, I, I, I do. I let people call me Pastor Henry because that's what I am or what I was or how I functioned for many, many, many years. And people know me by that. So I wasn't going to say, don't call me that anymore. Some people call me Brother Henry. You know, on my card, I don't even have a FIFO ministry gift on my card. I just have Reverend Henry Falcon. And that's not for anybody in the church. That's for, like, when we make contacts with a the hotel, they need to know you're a minister. You know, and that's why it says Reverend on there. I didn't want to put Pastor, Apostle, Prophet, Teacher, Evangelist, like I see on a lot of church. I'll never forget in Philadelphia. Oh, my God, I drove down Broad Street and it said, Pastor, Founder, Preacher, Fed, Evangelist. And they put the name, name on there. I said, oh, boy. Well, anyways, so um, they came back and God began to show us 
his heart. The glory of God reveals the heart of God. I'll say that again. The glory of God reveals the heartbeat of God. In the presence of God, you will know the works of God. In the presence of God, God will demonstrate to you his works. In the glory realm, he, he reveals to you his person and his heart. In the presence of the Lord, we are, we are receiving ministry, right? We're receiving ministry. We're receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We're receiving the fivefold ministry gifts. Why? So that we can function and do the Great Commission. And God enables us with a grace to do that. But that's not the same as glory. Mm -mm -mm -mm. No, sir, no, ma'am. The glory realm is completely different because it comes with an absolute dependence upon Jesus to be your head. In that glory realm, God sees the El Ra. He sees. And one of the things, the first thing that glory did in Milliken was cause us to repent. I was broken. I was undone after I realized what I did to the young people. You know, I did it because that's what I was taught. You know, we put them into Sunday school so we could have them color crayon. We could color, have them color pictures of Moses and Elijah. You know, we put them in, uh, you know, age appropriate groups so that they could do a little bit more study and tell them stories about Jesus. But you know what we didn't do? We didn't bring them to Jesus. We brought them to about Jesus and all Jesus has done. And that's exactly what you find in the holy praise. And thank God you find out what Jesus has done for us. That is the first thing we need to know. That's, that's right, but that's not where we're to stay. We're not to stay just in all that Jesus has done for us. We have to know the one who did it, the one who saved us. The one who delivered us. So we have to go past the blessings into the person. And when you go past the blessings of God, which come in the holy place, you enter into the realm behind the behind the veil, into the glory realm, where you've gone past the blessings to the person. The glory realm reveals the person of Jesus, the heart of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It reveals them in the fullness of seven spirits of God in the book of Revelation and in, in Ezekiel. They see the seven spirits of God. They see the seven golden lampstands. The spirit of prophecy is there, which is the testimony of Jesus. So there's a voice that speaks out of that, that sounds like thunder and lightning. There's a river that flows from the throne of God that does a washing in your life that is totally different than anything you've experienced in the church age. Because it's a sapphire sea, it's crystal, it's transparent. So when that river rushes you, you're healed. And what are you healed from? Not just physical ailments. You're healed from the hurts of your past, the sin, the, the habits. You're washed. It washes it away. The water of the word washes it. The river of life washes it away from you. And it replaces it with glory so that you can stand in true intimate fellowship with the Lord. True, intimate, and deep fellowship with the Lord. That's why he's standing in Revelation 3.20 and he's knocking because he's giving you an invitation to be married to him, to enter into the marriage supper of the Lord where you can see and know the Lord in the most deepest and intimate, deepest and intimate ways where in that glory, he will reveal to you his thoughts, his plans, his blueprints. Why? So you know exactly what to do every minute of your life. Notice in the holy place, we don't know that. Nope. We're always asking what the will of the Lord is. Come on now. How many times have you had this? Lord, what's your will? Lord, what's your will? Lord, what's your will? Notice that's part of the holy, uh, the holy place lacking because we can know some things of the Lord. We know how to tend to the Lord. We, we learn how to tend to the things of the Lord, the instruments of the Lord, but we don't learn how to tend to the Lord of the things. Not the Lord of the rings, but the Lord of the things. <laughs> Out of that fellowship and that deep fellowship, we begin to lose our identity of church life. And we begin to receive the identity of the kingdom of God through the king who wants to make himself known to us. And so when you're ready to pass out of the presence and go behind the veil, there has to be a hunger and a desperation in you for the more of God. How many know what I'm talking about? You can't be satisfied with what God does. You can't be satisfied with the work that God uses you for. The only thing that satisfies you is the Lord of the work. 
the Lord of the things, the one that does it. You want him and him alone. And you want to be one with him. You want to see him. You want to know him. You want to smell him. You want to taste him. You want to drink him. And like a bride who's in love with a bridegroom, her only desire is to be always with him, always continually. That's when you're open to come into the glory realm of God because that's where the bridegroom king lives because he's waiting to come for that bride. And he's waiting for that bride to make herself ready. In Revelation 19, 7, she made herself ready. Blessed are those that are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is a true saying, it says. So what, what happened is, is that as we begin to let go of the structures of our life, the areas we control, see that structure in the church system is we can, it's our control on it. The structure of our day of how we do it is our control on it. We have an idea of what we want to do, where we want to go. We kind of know what we need to do. So we put things into motion with these hands. And even the things God asks us to do, we put them in motion with these hands. And that's what we did at the services. But in Colorado, when we went up there, you know, first of all, I, I want to say to you, not one pastor came to the pastor's week of prayer. Not one, not one. The pastor host that came with me came one day and I, I think he felt he had to do something. So we began to change everything we had done. And I went over and just said, brother, I said, are we doing something wrong? Have we, um, you know, do you want us to pray a different way? Because this is what the Lord has been showing us while we're here to pray for these tent meetings. And he comes over to me, brother, I'm sorry. I, I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have even interfered. I just felt like I had to do something to let people know that I'm here. I shouldn't have done it. That was my flesh. Forgive me. You know, and then we went back to doing what we're doing. Well, on the second day, <laughs> the women at the well, <laughs> at this case, which uh, were um, Dolores and Mary Ramirez and Aunt Teresa went back and they told others. And Reverend Lynn, who is part of our team, and, and Reverend Mary and Dolores are still part of the spiritual mothers. They went out and they told people. And the next day we had 15 people, intercessors from the region. The following day we had 30. The next day after that, we had about 45. The next day after that, we had about 60. And by the time the tent meeting was done, we had over about 70 intercessors from all over the region. That's what glory does, 70. Supernaturally, we didn't know each other. But what did we do when we came together? They came and experienced, experienced God without the walls, without the structure. I didn't realize it then, but that was our first time of establishing David's tabernacle where people could come and find him and seek the face of God. It was so powerful and God gave us equipment to train them that by the time the tent meeting came, people stayed in that church building to pray and the rest went around and they surrounded the outside of the tents. For the first three days, we couldn't even go inside the tent. We just prayed around the tent. Look at how many people God gave us to pray around that tent. This is a supernatural work of glory. And then finally, we were able to go into the tent. And then you know, we had continually, the youth were on God's heart. You know, we, we prayed for the pastors, we prayed for the people, but the focus of God's heart was the young people. I'm telling you, ask anybody who was there. Remember, when we seek the Lord and we come into the glory realm, it's not what we think God wants us to do. God tells us what's on his heart. God tells us what he wants us to do. So we walk in a oneness with him. Glory is oneness and oneness is glory. And so God was training us. And this is, I told you, this is the first place I really understood the apostolic anointing because I did not know what to do. I had no clue, no blueprints, no plans. So in many ways, God sent us there as a forerunner. I, we had to trust him completely. We had to lean. You hear what I'm saying? We had to lean on him completely. I had no papers to follow, no, no things to do. We got the instructions and then we wrote them out and then we typed them out to give out to the intercessors. But we got it while we were in the presence of the Lord. We got blueprints and strategies for that tent meeting and for that city in that area. We didn't know that God was going to birth this work out of that. We had no idea. I was never going back to Colorado again, especially after my, my first encounter there. I'm sharing with you the practical working of presence to glory. When I came to Colorado, I went out to be alone with the Lord. And I ended up going to, a, uh, I forgot the name of the rest, Perkins restaurant, I think it was in, in Longmont, you know, cause we were staying in Longmont and, um, you know, uh, we ended up staying long. We weren't originally staying long, long, long. And I walked in there 
And this woman in the back of the restaurant runs out of her seat and coming screaming at me in my face. She said, why are you here? What do you think you are going to accomplish? Are you going to tell all the other pastors why you are here? And I said, oh, my God. I mean, that demon possessed her and spoke to me, challenged me to try to intimidate me so that I would not do what God had sent me there to do. I've never experienced anything like that in my life. I hear those stories in Africa, but I never heard those stories of that happening in a restaurant here in the United States of America. But it did. But that's because that enemy knew I was carrying something. I was carrying that glory of the Lord that I received back in Toronto, that change that God wanted to make to me in Toronto, that began to open me up to the new of God. Now, let me go back a little bit to that Toronto story so that you can begin to see where our journey was. When we went to Toronto, we had just got done a tremendous church empty. God had spoken a word to us that he was going to uproot the foundation of the church. And no more would I ever produce an Ishmael, but I would produce an Isaac after my own kind. I didn't know what the Ishmael was. I do now. It's because it's that structure we built that I was taught to build. I did it because I never even asked God if he wanted those things. I just did it because that's what you're supposed to do. Do you hear what I just said? I didn't ask God what he wanted. You see, I was doing all those things, going Sunday after Sunday. And yes, we had the presence of God there. But I got more out of my time alone with God on my keyboard. I would be home singing my heart out to God. I didn't even know you could do that. But I just sang. I sang in tongues. I sang new songs to the Lord. Just me and God alone, alone. And he would come and he would manifest himself to me. He would meet me in such a special way. There's times I would see angels and I'd see their wings going by. I mean, there's times he came and he hugged me and I would weep and weep and weep and weep and weep. And what was he doing? He was training me to know his person because I was seeking that person. That's what it means to enter the glory. You want the God of glory. That's his name. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, but he's also my husband king. Is this making sense to anybody? I wish more people would hear this. Remember to do a watch party, people, on Facebook so that others can watch it. And please share it when you're done. Because I'm teaching tonight about a, a, a personal expression, how God will take you individually from presence to glory. I didn't learn this in a church service. I learned this personally with the Lord. God personally taught me how to come up and to find him in ways I could have never thought ever possible. And it's not, I didn't have a worship service at my house. I didn't have a praise service at my house. I wasn't just praising and worshiping because that's what I was do. No, I was singing my heart out to God because I loved him that much. And I was seeking his face because he was worthy to be praised and sought after. I still want to see him. I still want to know him. Don't you personally? My heart burns for that. It yearns for him. It yearns to be completed in him, finished in him, to be by his side forever and ever, to be a king and a priest to the Lord, a bride of the Lord, an overcomer, you know, a man child. And in that, you know, closeness, like I, like Isaiah, I'm undone because the closer you get, the more the light of his glory and his holiness shines on you. And he begins to allow those eyes of fire that I talked about yesterday to pierce your heart. To come into the glory realm is to look into the eyes of fire. And those eyes of fire are like fuller soap, I said this Sunday, and a refining fire. It's the spirit of burning and the spirit of judgment in Isaiah chapter 4, which God comes as fire and judgments to, to beautify us, finish us, to remove the haughtiness, to remove those filthy rags that are on us. Only his fire eyes and his fire face and his fire hair and the fire in his feet can refine us and prepare us so that we can be acclimated to live and walk in the realm of his glory. He allows us to go up and taste it, those of you that seek it, and it will come down and let you taste it some. But to dwell there permanently, we have to be prepared for. To dwell there continually, we need a divine intervention of the Lord where God will come supernaturally on the third day to finish us. On the third day, I've come to finish my course. Today and tomorrow, I do healings and miracles. But on the third day, I finish my work. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana, and we see the finishing work of the Lord. And what was that finishing work of the Lord on the third day at that wedding? The wine was about to run out. 
and they needed more wine. There was no time to plant trees. There was no time to run out to the vineyard and get it the way that we used to get it. There was no time to get the grapes and crush them with our feet. There was no time to distill them. Do you understand? There was no time to do it the way that you always make wine. I don't know if you're hearing me. There's no time to do it the way we did it yesterday. And that's the problem with so many kingdom-minded ministers today. You know, they want to go back to the book of Acts. They want to use, I said this, oh, I'm going to keep saying it. They want to do it the way of the old model. They want to go back and plant trees that produce grapes so that you can crush them. There's no time. Do you see, Jesus has to make wine in a new way. Come on. He has to bring new wine in a new way. And he does it completely out of the box. He could have said, go cut down some, go out here. He could have made the wine last, go out to the vineyards, get me some grapes. I'm going to stamp on, I'm going to stomp on them. I'll even do it supernaturally so I can make it fast. I'll even put my hands on them so they can ferment fast and I can make it the way you make it. Nope. He was going to make it from his glory. And this is the first miracle John says that Jesus does to show forth his glory. What does he do? He makes new wine. Supernaturally. And what does he do? He takes six clay pots that were set apart for purification or foot washing. And he tells the servants to do one thing. Fill them up to the brim. That's it. Get water and fill it up to the brim. Now, I'll go back to the 90s. I'm standing in Toronto at the Catch the Fire conference. The man that took me there was the one that wanted to get me out of the church, but he had changed. You know, he was the one that was agreeing with my other elder that I shouldn't be, that I'm not a pastor, that I'm really an evangelist. They kept telling me over and over, you're an evangelist. Do I look like an evangelist? Do I sound like an evangelist? Those of you who watch my broadcast, I know evangelists. I know how they operate. I don't sound like them. I don't work like them. I don't operate like them. Can I do the work in an evangelist? Of course I can, by the Spirit of God. But that's not my calling. My, you know, It's not. You, you can tell an evangelist that has that predominant call upon their life. You know? And that's not me. Not that I can't function like that, because I have and I will when God needs me to be. But they were convinced I didn't belong pastoring the church. That's the bottom line. And so they did a lot of damage to me and Donna, a lot of hurt. They didn't, the enemy did through them. We were wrecked. We were wrecked, Donna and I. I said these words. I mean, I had people leave our church at the time. And at this time, we were beginning to really open up and take the boundaries down. I take down the structure. Our services were six, seven hours every Sunday, and God was mightily moving powerfully, healing, delivering, setting people free. People were growing in the Lord. But after a while, that spirit said, can you kind of cut the services down? Can you do like a normal Sunday morning service, and then maybe at Sunday night we can do this, let those that want to come? That made sense. It made sense. And it was very tempting to go back and put services back, put the structure back. Maybe change a little bit about the way we do it and call it new. That was my temptation. And that's the temptation for many kingdom ministers today is to take a little bit of that kingdom so that you can still fit it into the church structure so everybody can be home on time. Or you get to preach all the messages or you bring in all the guest ministers to preach and the body never functions. That's what happens Sunday after Sunday, Wednesday after Wednesday. And that's why the glory of the Lord's not there because he's not welcome to be there in his glory. So this elder came and he sat in my room and Donna knows him. He was a theologian. This guy, I couldn't even understand the words he was talking. I, he had a, I, I don't know if the, the, I know he had at least the master's degree. He may have even had a doctorate. I don't know. He was so smart, you know, and the other elder was so knowledgeable in the world, but operating under a counterfeit spirit. You know, so between the two of them, I didn't have a shot and Donna didn't have a shot. Everything inside was trying to push us out but yet god was trying to change us out not push us out he we had no intention to push us out of the church he said i'm going to uproot the foundation of this church and no longer you're going to produce an ishmael but you're going to produce an isaac after your own kind and and the prophet said pastor henry i see you in that day i see you in your office crying where did they go where did they go they're all gone 
And the Lord wants you to know that in that day, the Lord himself will lay the foundation for your life and for the church. Well, that day came. I'll never forget it. You know, we had over 200 people in the church. And within the six months, we went from 200 to, to 40. We lost 160 people. We had a Christian school going on at the same time. We we're doing all the outreaches and activities. Everything shut down so fast. The finances left so fast that I couldn't even pay my, my home. And I ended up losing my home. There just wasn't enough time to, to do anything. And can you imagine how devastated we were? We ended up having to give up the church building because we couldn't afford it, you know? And so everything we had worked to put into place got removed. And I remember just before all that happened, my last two elders who were very good friends with us and our kids were friends with their kids, they came into my office and they said, uh, Pastor Henry, we just want to tell you, we love you, but we're leaving. I said, oh no, not you guys, not you, not you. We've been through this all together. Why would you leave now? And he looked at me right in the face and said, well, everybody else left. There must be something wrong with you. I just want you to think about what that did. We were so hurt and so broken and we looked like such failures to the world, to the religious leaders. We tried to serve God to the best of our abilities. We love God. You know, I, there, I didn't take a salary. I paid all my employees first. You know, I wanted to make sure everybody was taken care of. There were students that couldn't afford to pay their tuition. I let them stay where my kids, when they went to Christian school, the pastor wanted me to take them out because we couldn't pay it. I learned if that ever happened to me, if I ever have a Christian school, they're going to stay. I'm not going to put a child who wants to learn about God out because they can't afford it. And I was a pastor and they knew it, but they didn't care. It was all about the money, honey. So we were pretty devastated and broken when we went to Toronto. And so why did God have to bring us and reveal his glory and not just his presence? We had experience the presence. But when I went up to Toronto, I'm tying this all together. The theme of that songs were all about the river of God. And I mean, new river songs, they were about two things, fire and the river, the fire of God and the river of God, water and fire. That was the theme of the songs and the worship of God. And in that place, there was true worship, pure, holy worship of God. I mean, and they brought this woman in, Joanne McFadder, okay? And she sang a song off of one of her CDs called the Gethsemane Song. I had never heard a song like that. This is not... Jesus, I adore you. Wonderful song. This was a song of intimacy between the Father and the Son. Why did I have to hear that song? Because it was the Father singing to the Son and the Son singing to the Father. And Jesus was singing to the Father, Father, take this cup, if it be your will, take this cup from me. You know, you know, and, and, and all that. And the Father's encouraging the Son you know, that he's going to make it, you know, and, and I mean, it was, it's a beautiful song. If you want to hear it, it's on Magnificent Obsession, uh, uh, Joey McFadder's uh, CD called Magnificent, uh, Magnificent Obsession. Beloved, when I heard that song, I, I think they sang two songs before that one. When she sang that song, I never heard another thing. I know now, I didn't know then that I was immediately caught up into the glory realm. And what happens in the glory realm? Why is it different from its presence? I was broken. I was in the presence of the Lord. I mean, I was trying to serve God, but why was I not being healed? What was happening? Why wasn't I being made whole in that place? Because it says in Hebrews chapter nine, that the, the ritual acts of worship in the holy place can never perfect the conscience of a believer as long as a holy place remains a recognized institution and is still standing. As long as a holy place remains a recognized institution and still standing where the priests give their ritual acts of worship, you can never be perfected, which means come into maturity. For us to come into maturity, we need to see Jesus, like I described him on Sunday. We need to see Jesus, the King of glory. We need to see Jesus with his eyes like fire, his face burning like the noonday sun, with his hair as white as snow and a double-edged sword coming out of his mouth, because that's the head that has to be connected to this body. It was there I began to see that head. I didn't know it then. 
I didn't know it. I didn't understand these things back then. I understand them now. I didn't understand them. And Donna probably can say we didn't understand it back then. But all we knew that that Jesus was there. Jesus was there. I didn't see John Arnott. Uh, John Arnott. I didn't see Randy Clark. I didn't see all the other people there. I heard their messages, but I never heard their message. God came and he met me there. I met the living Christ there. I met the King of Glory there. So powerful was that meeting that I fell down like a dead man on my on, on the floor while they're preaching, while they're ministering, and I'm rolling. I'm rolling back and forth. I'm laughing and I'm crying. And God is dealing with me in his glory. What is he dealing with? He's dealing with me with the hurts. He's dealing with me, first of all, with my relationship with my father. We went up there and I needed a lot of finances. God had just told me to give every penny that I got in my hands to another woman so that she, another woman could buy her house. So that she was a, the mother of one of our, um, our, 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 that came to our church. And Donna knew it. I get, the Lord put thousands of dollars so that they could have the down payment. Now I needed mine to be able, because when we got back, we had to, you know, we had to get, you know, to, 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 to get our house. And so we were really broken, devastated. And all that was done to me. And all that was done to Donna. I had no idea. But the biggest thing I had to deal with there is my father. My father was an abusive alcoholic. And he beat my mother to a pulp too many times. I grew up and I remember becoming a Cub Scout. And I got my Cub Scout knife and I put it under my I put it under my um, mattress because I was waiting until I got 13 years old because when I was 13, I was going to kill him so that he wouldn't hurt my mother anymore. Isn't that horrible? All of those things were buried inside of me. And then to face the rejection and the persecution of the, of the people that we trusted and loved, other pastors and ministers who all turned their backs on us and left us to die. I didn't understand that. I told Donna, I will never trust another Christian as long as I live. I said that. And before I could get the words out of my mouth, the Lord said, not only are you going to trust another Christian, but you're going to put your heart out there like I did. And if, if they walk on you like a doormat, I did that for you. You will do that for them and you will forgive them and love them even if they're your enemies. I didn't even have a chance to, to stay in that. But the pain was still there. Now, the first thing that God had to deal with with me was to heal that with all that that hurt. And he was dealing with my father first. And then he was while I'm on the floor. I mean, they must have preached for two hours. It was a long time I was there. I don't even know what Donna was doing. I think she was I think God was dealing with her at the same time. And but Jesus was there. He was so there. We smelt him. We smelt roses right down. The smell of roses filled the place and the rooms that we were. I mean, his aroma was there. His glory was there. His, he was there in our midst. And he was there meeting with me personally. That's what happens in the glory realm. There's an impersonal one-on-one. -on -one. And do you think Jesus is going to leave you hurt? Do you think Jesus is going to leave those habits and things inside of you when you meet him in glory? Don't you understand that it's that very glory that's going to finish you and complete you and remove everything that you thought could never leave? You've been saying, Lord, I'll never make it. I'll never be finished. Because every time I try to fix myself, I can't. And it gets worse. And then somebody says, read this book, read this scripture, fast more, pray more. And we try to do all those things and we're not changed. But one second in the glory, we're changed forever. One glimpse of those eyes of fire, you're changed for the rest of your life. One word that comes from the spirit of prophecy, the testimony of Jesus, that thunder and lightning. And you are changed in a moment. I was being changed on that floor. I was being prepared for this day. I was being prepared so that I could be on this broadcast tonight and explain to you what glory is. What is the glory of God? It's the person of Jesus. Manifested so that you can see him, taste him, touch him, smell him, and hear him. He makes himself know in such a real way that when you look upon that face, as you look in the mirror, you are instantly changed, transformed, and tra transfigured from glory to glory. While I was on that floor, I was being changed. I stayed on that floor, and all of a sudden, I felt the spirit of the God lift, and they were done the message, and they were, they were giving an altar call. When they gave that altar call, by the time I got to my feet, and Donna got, got, got up with me, the place was packed. There was no room for us to stand. 
we had to go outside into the hallway of the Regal Constellation Hotel in, in, in um, where were we? Toronto, Canada, big, huge hotel. And they start making a line in the hallway outside. I'm standing there and said, by the time anybody ever gets to us, man, and they said, just close your eyes and just worship the Lord. And then they had ministers and people going on. Now, the amazing thing about this night is God had to change us and begin to reveal the preparation for glory. I told you, we have to be prepared. You know, we have to be for the acclamation, for the preparation. We have to have an acclamation for the preparation to begin to learn how to function in the glory realm. But if you don't know what it is, you can't function in it. Can you see tonight? I hope you can see how the difference between the presence of God and the glory wealth. Maybe people got met there in the presence of the Lord. That didn't happen to me. That didn't happen to Donna. I know it now because I've experienced that glory. And I know the difference between the presence of God in a meeting and the glory of God. The glory of God, God always reveals his person, not his work. The work happens, but the focus is on him, the person. And when your focus is on him, not only do you get the work, but you get him. And the presence, you may get the work, but you don't get him. He's hiding behind a lattice and seeing if you're going to recognize him. I met him this way at home. I did. I did. God met me many times that way at home. And I think that was part of being able to teach me how to go up. But I have never met him as he was as a corporate head. As I did there, I met him as an individual head over my life there to that degree. And I would go in and out of that place. Here, there was a corporate expression of Jesus as the head connected to his body. And so I'm standing out in the hallway. And all of a sudden, now the, the two pastors, Randy Clark and, and John Arnett, are not, were vineyard pastors. And if you know anything about the vineyard, the, I would call them the laid back church. Every other church, you wore a suit and tie on Sunday. Vineyard, it was blue jeans, shirt, sneakers, come as you are. You know, the vineyard was kind of birthed out of the Jesus movement back in the 60s and 70s. And as they got birthed forward, they, they, they had a heart for body ministry, where the body would begin to function. So I believe God chose them for a reason, because they had the heart for the body to minister. And for the glory to operate, the body has to minister. He could have went anywhere else and they could have had a revival. This was not a revival. They called it a renewal. They called it a refreshing. To me, it was the realm of glory. And how do I know that? Because this was preparing us for the year 2000. And what was happening there was a miracle at Cana. The beginning of the third day was about to be ushered in. And at the end of the second day, the wine of the Holy Spirit has just about run out. And the man's testimony was he was ready to give up and kill himself, shut the churches down. And there are so many pastors who are at that point, maybe today, that they're ready to shut everything down because it's just not working. Not enough finances. People are not faithful. All the problems in the church and of, of, of a life that's not totally surrendered to the Lord in people's hearts. But on that floor, okay, you know, God took the daggers Started to take the daggers out of my heart. I'll tell you a little bit more in a minute. So I stand out in that line. Remember what God said to me? I don't want, I want you to worship until I tell you to stop. I want you to let the people minister until I tell you to stop. I'll let you share what I gave you until I tell you to stop. And then you can minister to me and let the people minister to me and to each other until I tell you to stop. That was the beginning of removing the box and the structure so that I would begin to understand that the glory of God doesn't fit that structure. The glory of God was made for the tabernacle to be seen within us. The kingdom of God is within us. Anyways, personally, and those that have come to the convergence, if you were to ask them, they have all experienced what I'm telling you. Every one of them that have come have been undone. They've had a personal encounter with God. They've had a personal life-changing encounter with God. God has dealt with their innermost thoughts, their beings, their spirit, and has removed them. And everything that was in darkness came out to the light in the convergences, just like it did in Toronto. It came out into the light. But instead of running away and hiding and trying to fix it, they stayed and we stayed. And God didn't fix us. 
He transformed us. God didn't fix us. He transformed us. When I went to Toronto and why I went 13 times, I didn't get fixed there. I didn't get fixed so I could go back to doing what we were doing, Don and I. We got changed there. We got transformed there to become a different people. And we were totally different, totally different in our pursuit of the Lord. It was there we got our missionary call. And one of the several, several maybe a year and a half later, we had a meeting where Ruth Fossil, who's a violinist minister, psalmist of the Lord, she came and she took her violin while I was laying out on the floor and she played over me. And that's where God commissioned me to do this work. Right then and there, the words that he told me, what are we going to do? And it's all come to pass. Little did I know that I got separated from Donna. She's on the other side of the platform. And Ruth goes over to her and plays the same song she played over me, over Donna. But she prophesies it over her, word for word. So Donna heard exactly what I heard. I got it directly in, from the Lord inwardly. She got it directly from the Lord outwardly. Only God. And we were totally changed and transformed and never the same. All of that was a preparation for this day. And so what I'm seeing now at these convergences is God is accelerating what we experienced over all of those years that he can do in a single meeting in six days. They received everything that we received, all the deliverance, all the healing, everything that we received from that glory that, that we began to experience there, they're receiving at one single convergence. And you don't want to come? You, because I can get this at home. I had to travel to Toronto, Canada to get that. Why? God could have did that in my house, but he didn't. He did it with thousands of people and in front of thousands of people. And he did the same thing in them that were open to it as he did in me. Go figure. Why go someplace? I've gotten persecuted by people that I have loved who know, knew me their whole life saying, well, I don't believe in what you're saying right now because I don't think you have to go anywhere. And why does it have to be just a select few going to this place? You tell me why I had to go meet him in Canada. I don't know why. And why did I have to keep going back? Because I needed to be made whole. Because God was making me whole by his glory. There was a tangible person of the Lord to those that were hungering for it. Not everybody experienced that way. Some people probably experienced nothing. Some experienced church presence. I didn't, Donna didn't, and I can tell you thousands or maybe millions of more who experienced the Lord as a person as we did. Matter of fact, when we came back from those meetings, that same power and glory filled our church without doing anything. So we stood out in that hotel line and this never happens. The guest ministers usually always stay at the front, but this says something about the character of John and, and Randy. You know where they came? They went to the back of the room. Who goes into the hallway? Not the ones with the, probably with the suit and ties on, not the ones who love the front seats, not the ones that want everybody to come to them. Nope. That all happens in the presence, in the glory. It was different. They went out into the hallway. Did God send them there because we were there? I don't know. I don't think so. I think he just sent them there. That the people in the back were just as important. Oh, my God, am I saying something? The people in the back, the people that are not seen are just as important as the ones that are up at the front. What a novel concept, huh? And we won't give up those front seats because that's for the elders and the deacons. And they sat there for 28 years. Glory smashes that. <laughs> Glory smashes that. Because there's no big people and no little people. It's just God and his people. When John came up to me, he only said one thing to me. He said, brother, I know you love the Lord. But you like control, don't you? And I said, I guess I do. That's all I said. And boom, I was one of the most freest pastors in the whole region. We let God move. Many of them didn't. So for God to say you like control, what was that? That was all the remaining of Ishmael. Do you know what Ishmael's name means? His hand is against every man's hands and every man's hands is against him. When we have strife and competition, it's because of our hands wanting to build something in the name of the Lord or in the name of ourselves. And I fell to the floor again. And this time, God really dealt with me with my dad. I didn't realize 
how I was controlling my heart, how I was protecting it. I had defenses of my heart and my emotions that wasn't letting the Lord in and it wouldn't let people in. I would only let them in so far because I did not want to be hurt again. You see what fire eyes do? Do you know how many meetings I went to? Do you know how many conferences I went to? And God never said that to me until here. Because this is where those eyes, it says, and, I, and, and it says in Revelation, it says, and it says, and I will look at you with the fire of my eyes and I will thoroughly discern the thoughts and the intentions of your heart. I am he that searches the hearts and I see the intentions and the motives of the heart. God was getting right to the motives. Why? He was mad at me. He was angry with me. No, he was preparing me for the acclamation of glory. He knew that I could never be here on this broadcast tonight if those things remained in me. And how are you going to walk in the glory realm? And God to bring freedom through you if you allow those things to remain in you. And sometimes you have to get up and travel to a place where the Lord wants to meet you and calling you to meet him like Peter and James and John had to go up to that high mountain of the Lord to see Jesus in that glory. Why won't you come to Florida? Or the next one after that? Or the next one after that? I can't afford it. I couldn't afford going to Toronto, but I went 13 times. I could not afford going to Toronto, but I was desperate. I was desperate, I was hungry, and I was needy for the person of God. I wanted the more of God. I wanted everything out of me that could possibly, and I brought everybody that I knew up to there to them so that they could experience and meet the Lord that way. I didn't say, well, you know what? I heard churches were, you know, it would break out in the churches when they got home. It broke out in ours. I could have said, hmm, man, I could really build something with this. Maybe I can bring them down to my church. No, I kept going back and back and back and back and back. Why? 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 Because it wasn't about me. It wasn't about ministry. It was about God. He was there. Jesus was there. I saw him. I heard him. I was touched by him. He changed me there. Did I physically see him? Sometimes I did with my spirit's eyes. Did I see him naturally there? No, but I did see him. I smelt him. We were in one room and I will never forget. Man, these ladies were skinning. These old ladies were getting filled with the power of God and their hands were going like this, like propeller arms. That's what they call them. They were going so fast that they got, God's power was manifesting in that. And I know many of you say, man, that ain't God. That's not God. God would never do that. Oh, you're God. You can tell him what he can do and what he can't do. He does those foolish things to see who wants him and who doesn't. Now, there are people who do stupid and foolish things. You can discern those things, but don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. I almost did. I looked at Donna and roses right down. It was the smell of roses was going through all the way. We were in the overflow in the hallway, but then, yeah, and that's where God met us. I forgot to tell you this before I go on. Donna's on the other side of the hallway in that, and I'll go back to the roses in a minute. And John Arnett goes up to her. And you know what he says to her? I know you love the Lord or something like that, but you really like control, don't you? Word, but we both, every time we were there, we both got the same word. How does that happen? And she fell on the floor and she started laughing and crying. And we were literally rolling from one side of the hallway to the other. And now I know why they called them holy rollers. Because for that, for, that, for that season, we were really holy rollers. We weren't trying to roll, we just did. You didn't even know where you were. I'm serious. I didn't even know. I was such in God's glory. I didn't, I was, Donna, you can say the thing. We were not aware of the room. We were not aware of the people. We weren't aware of the ministers. It was God and us. And God had to teach us how to meet him there. And then for the next 15, 20 years, he has prepared us step in step so that when 2020 came and the time for the kingdom of God to be seen and come into daylight, he says, now, Henry, I want you to go and I want you to gather my people to me. I don't want any agenda. I don't want any guest speakers. I just want you to come and minister to my heart. And I just want you to invite those that want to come and meet with me. I don't want you to be invite any guest speakers because the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, we are the guest speakers. All I want you to do is come and I will do the rest. You just come. And little did I know that really is the heart of God in his tabernacle. And I so thank God that God prepared us for this, that Sarah, Amber, Jared, Michelle, 
J.A., others who have come and, and, and people, I can't even name all the people that came, pastors, ministers, experienced God differently. There was a set of pastors up in New York that have been so changed by this that they can never go back to where they were. There's, there, there are prophetesses that came. They can never go back to where they were. They see what God is building. They're beginning to flow. They begin to see the change from presence to glory, the change that is needed. The structure has to go. The old wineskin has to go so that God can make a new wineskin to contain this glory. That's what God was doing there up there. And so going into that room, going back in that room, they were teaching about worship, prophetic worship. We had just started prophetic worship. Matter of fact, we got our credentials pulled from us because I refused not to sing prophetically. They told me I couldn't do it. And if I continue to do it, and if I took the services back after two hours, they're going to take my credentials from me. And I had to choose, Don and I had to pray. Do we, do we listen to that? Are we being disobedient? Or are we going to stay and please God? We knew that this time what they were asking to do was against what God had told us. And so we chose to please God and we gave our credentials back. And then they blacklisted us and all that. And that's why we ended up in, in Toronto. So we're in the room and the smell of roses and Jesus was there so thick. I could see him and feel him and touch him. And I'm watching these ladies and I'm seeing Jesus touch them. I'm seeing him spiritually go over to him and put his hands on their heads and they start shaking like this. And I'm looking, I'm saying, Lord, I don't know if I want. And before I could finish that word, I don't know if I want. Oh my God, electricity came right through me. He must have come over and stood over me and put his hands on me. And I'm telling you, I have never felt such power in my in my life. I felt like I could have picked up that building and throw it from, from, from Toronto to California. It, my, my, I had propeller arms. And the Lord, as he's doing this, said, if you don't want that, you don't want me. I said, okay, Lord, <laughs> boom. That doesn't happen now very often. It happens. But for that season in my life, I needed to know what the power of God felt like. I needed to see Jesus filling us with that power. I needed to smell his. I needed to see him and his ability, his glory to completely change our lives and transform them. What do you think the church needs now? More programs? More stuff to do? More things to put on the calendar? That's what they need right now? Are you kidding me? They need his glory. They need to experience the glory of God. They need to come up to the mountain of the Lord with clean hands and pure heart and invite the king of glory to come in. We don't need more teaching and more programs from yesterday. We don't need to go back and build the model of the book of Acts church. That was yesterday. We need the glory of God to fill the temple so that God can have a people, an army, a wheel within a wheel, a kingdom of a royal priesthood and a holy nation that he can stand in and with and transform the kingdoms of this world into the kingdoms of our God. And you can't do that with just the presence of the Lord. You can't do it in the outer court. You can't do it living in the holy place. You've got to enter in behind the veil into the holy of holies. And you've got to live in the holy of holies. And the holy of holies has to live in you. And that's what God was preparing us for. We had so much junk in us. We had so much junk in our trunk. I can't even tell you. All these things, the snares, the sins that easily beset us, we were full of them. And you know what God did for those 13 times? He began to remove every one of them, open our eyes. The last thing I'll share with you is the body ministry. Because in, as we went, more and more people got transformed. And they began to raise up ordinary people. And so when it came time to worship, guess what? They were just ordinary people. They weren't big names there anymore. They, some of them became big names because of what God did with them. They were just like you and I. They just ministered to the Lord and to the Lord's heart. And then when it was time to pray, you know, there were ministers there that prayed, but most of the people were just ordinary people. And so I'm in this line, right? And, and, and they're, they're coming to pray with me. And there was a big guy down there, and I really wanted the big guy. I'm still looking for the big boys back at that time. And I'm watching this trio coming over. And one of them, man, he was sweating so much. He had the worst body odor you could ever imagine. And I said, Lord, I think I'm going to throw up if he comes over here. Lord, I said, Lord, please send somebody else. You know, there, there I was in the flesh. Well, guess what? God didn't answer. Those three came right to me. And they looked me in the face and said, brother, you have been so hurt and damaged. 
and they prophesied. They began to speak by the presence of God, by the glory of God. He said, pastors and leaders, they have betrayed you. They said, word for word, only God showed them this. And as they did, they started to take daggers out of my back. They said, we see seven daggers in your back and we need to pull them out. I felt them come out. And when they pulled that last seventh one, I fell on my face like a dead man. And for the first time in I don't know how many years, I felt free. And here I am, a man of God, right? First time I felt free in years. The damage was gone by the glory. The damage was gone by the glory. The hurt was gone by the glory. God used these three people for a reason, but they ministered from his glory. A glory that was beyond just somebody praying a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom on you, because it went to the depth of my being beyond anything I could have ever experienced before. The damage was undone by the glory, and I was made whole by the glory. After going all of those times, Donna, you know this, that's when we were released to go. Look at the preparation by glory to be able to walk in the glory and make the glory our main function and purpose. But in that glory, what? All your needs will be met and the needs of the people. Maybe Sunday I'll share a little bit more about that presence from the glory to glory. I just want you to see what the Lord had to do personally. Tonight's about person, about you. What will glory do when you step in it? What does the glory of God bring? It brings the eyes of fire that he can see exactly the things that are killing you. He has come and manifested to destroy the works of the devil. He'll have a double-edged sword of his mouth and he will speak. He spoke to me on the floor personally. He spoke to Donna on the floor personally. He stood over us personally. He used people too, but most of the ministry we received in Toronto for all those years was person face-to-face -face with the Lord. Very few times did God bring people to us but he brought people to us at the right time in the right place. And we were changed by that glory. Now, I'll end with this. And Jesus commanded his disciples to take six, uh, his servants, to take six clay pots set apart for feet washing and fill them up to the brim. Why six? Number one, it's the number of man. Number two, it's the number of prophetic days. 4,000 years from Christ, uh, from um, Adam to Christ, 2,000 years from Christ to, um, to now. And this is in the 90s. And they were filled up to the brim. And what did I say that the songs that came out of were about? The river? Donna, you know I'm talking it, right? They sang about the river. The river's here, the healing of the river, and then the fire. And so at that moment, there's only water. And that's what we experienced. But look at what that water did. But then he said, draw some out. And I believe we were part of that some. And as, we, as that servant drew some out, right? Okay, it changed. Glory changes what you where you cannot see. Man can't make glory. Man can't operate glory. Man can't manipulate glory. Man can't make glory work, even though they try. The minute he drew some out, the glory of God came to change water, the substance of it, into wine. And it became something it never was before. And how was this wine made? Remember how I started tonight? He could have made that little bit of wine that they had last. He could have supernaturally made a vineyard grow. He could have sent them to the nearest vineyard, grab all the grapes that they could, squish them with his own supernatural feet and make instant wine on the floor. But that wine would have been made in the same way it had already been, always been made. The wine that we are drinking of this kingdom age glory is not made by man's hands, made, but it's made by God. God made the water and God changed the water into wine, and not one man did it but God. That's what the glory realms all about. It's all about God and his work within his people.
The servants filled the pot, they drew it out, they obeyed his command, and on the journey, it got changed. And what did the, 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 the uh, caterer say? He said, stop everything. This is what glory does. Stop everything you're doing. I need to say something. Every other wedding I've been to, they serve the best wine first. And when people get drunk, then they put in the cheaper wine. But you, you have saved the best wine for last. How prophetic is that? And then John writes and closes with these words. And this is the first miracle that Jesus did to show forth his glory. He, he made a wine that no man could make. He did it on the journey. That's right, Nicole. It was on the way there. It got changed. We don't know how. We don't know when. And here's the other incredible part. So did all the other pots get changed. As, as they were on the journey, the rest of the pots got changed to, to, to new wine. And that is what glory is doing in everyone that is seeking his face right now. All of you that are falling in love with Jesus, all of you who have heard that knock on the door and say, come in, Jesus. Sup with me. You're experiencing the life-changing, transformational marriage supper of the Lamb. And you're drinking that wine that he said, I will not drink the fruit of this cup again until I drink it with you in heaven. Now he's bringing us up into the heavenlies to drink that new wine with us that we're being changed from water to wine. Father, I thank you tonight. I thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace. And I pray such a release tonight, Lord, a strengthening, an enabling, a quickening. Lord, I shared what you did and how you changed us. But it was you who did it. We saw you. You did it. We didn't see the work you did. We saw you who did the work. And we have never been the same. You changed us there. You prepared us there. And now again, you've come in 2020 to, to prepare us for the final work of the Lord, the finishing work of this new wine. And in 2021, you came to position us so that we'd be ready. So that in 2022, we would begin to be propelled with that glory. And I know, Lord, that by the end of this year, we will be propelled. And in 2023, we are going to advance the kingdom of God on the earth in ways we have never sown, saw before as a wheel within a wheel filled with your glory. Lord, I pray that today that you would teach each one watching this broadcast what they need to bring to you now how to let go of everything and let go of their life as they've known them to be and just allow you to come with your fire eyes to see, to heal, to remove and your fire words that will come and bring healing deliverance and your fire feet that will refine us like gold and silver so that we can be changed from water to wine so that we can be a bride married to you, full grown sons, priests and kings unto our God, a royal priest and a holy nation so that we would be ready to work with you for your end time purposes on the earth. Father, I pray such a strengthening, such a release. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, just receive that right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 That's the realm of glory. God does in that glory what men cannot do or can ever do. Only his glory can do it. He can fill you to do it just like he did those people, but it's his glory. It's him doing it. And when you're done, you don't see a person. You don't see a ministry. You see Jesus. I didn't testify of John Arnett except the fact that he came to the back of the room, which was really a, a credit to his character. But John Arnett didn't change me. He just said one word. Jesus changed me. Jesus changed Donna. Jesus changed our lives. And we would not be here today without that. Now on Sunday, when we come back, I'm going to pick up on this personal change from, from um, uh, uh, presence to glory. I'm going to share with you about how that operated in New York, because the Lord is showing me there are things there that will help you to understand what you need to do, what needs to change, how to make this real within your life so that you can go deeper and deeper into the Lord. I hope that will be a blessing for you. Amen. Thank you, Lord. On our screen, on the chat line, 
uh, on the chat, uh, thank you, Sarah, is an invitation. If you want to come to the next Convergence and experience what we experience, we're going to be in um, in Jacksonville, actually in Orange Park, uh, Florida, for the, the Greater St. Saint Augustine Jacksonville Convergence. And the days are, I think, October 24th to the 29th. I hope I got that right. But if you go to that link, you can register now. We have a discounted hotel room. Amen. We also have, you click on the RSVP, go to the website, click on the RSVP. And then you have to register twice, once for the convergence and seating is limited. And then there's a second one where you get the hotel discounted rate. So I would encourage you to do it now before it gets booked up. There's no registration fee. You just come. Just come. And I know your life will be changed. If you're a musician, a singer, a dancer, flag ministry, and you know things that you've experienced David's tabernacle style of worship, come because you'll be able to do that. Amen. Praise God. Now, the last thing I'm going to say is I want to thank everyone. For those of you that are praying for us, encouraging us, and those of you that God has touched to so to not to bless us financially. Don and I are, are missionaries. And we are dependent upon the Lord to provide us to live and to go. So every finance that you send is to help us live and to be able to go to where God is sending us. And um, um, on the chat line, you'll see a way to do that. Now, I say that because there are people who ask me that, that have never been there and they've been blessed by it and they feel led that they want to do it. Now, if God touches you to do that, you've got the same opportunity to be able to do that. But no one has to do that. And I'm not diminishing that. I'm not trying to diminish giving because living is for giving and giving is for living. So giving is really important to God, but it can't be forceful. It can't be demanded. It can't be, unless you do this, it has to be given out of the heart of love because you want to do it. And you love God that much and you love us that much to do it. So if God touches you tonight to do that, thank you for doing it. And for all of you that have, thank you. Amen. Thank you, Lord. My email's on there if we can serve you in any way. And I hope I hope tonight was a blessing to you. I'm just trying to scroll through to see if there's anything that I need to read. Any com comments? I think we had good scribing. We had good scribes on tonight, writing down the, the gist of the notes. Yeah. Amen, Nicole. I'm just saying yes to that. Yeah. Praise God. Okay. I guess we're good. Well, thank you for listening. We love you. Appreciate you. Share this with people, all right? I know it's a little bit longer, but there's so much meat in them, you know, that, you know, it's, it's for you, for those that are hungry. Good night. God bless you. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.